Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ala ba'da Habita fillah A comment was made from a brother May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us in him and preserve us in him I mean And he made a couple of points and I wanted to just highlight this because It seems that there is a uh, A lot of shubha had a lot of doubtful things going around about some of these issues and these issues need to be addressed in one form or another. And we also have to realize that from the people, sometimes even from the students of knowledge and so forth, you're gonna hear different views about some of these topics and how to address with these real world issues that we face. And one of the issues is that we face in being a Muslim minority in whether we're in America, the UK, France, Italy, Germany, what have you, uh, that you face uh, different issues on the ground and each of those countries in fact have their own particular issues no doubt. There are common issues they face as Muslim minorities and then there's also very unique issues that each of those countries uh, face. So that brings up the issue about scholarship and we're going to, going to talk about this very quickly about some of these issues the brother mentioned because they're very important issues that we will have to grasp and we will have to deal with as a Muslim community and more specifically as Salafis as well because we are not excluded from the greater Muslim community we are not excluded from these issues and having to deal with these issues but it just depends how we deal with these issues and what will the narrative or what will the conversation be like in 10, 15, 20 years? Certain things that are absolutely we can't accept we, or we don't believe in accepting now, perhaps the conversation will be different in 10 to 20 years time because of norms will change. And we have to be uh, have some insight into these issues. One of the issues he mentioned, he said, I hate when brothers speak Arabic uh, and he said, uh, except for it should only be in the situation of restricted to ayats of the Quran and maybe the Sunnah. So this is uh, perhaps a valid criticism to a greater or lesser extent. To hate, this is very strong, but I think I understand the meaning of what the brother is saying. And I think, speaking for myself and probably some of other students, but I can definitely speak for myself, of course, that I use Arabic sometimes more often than not in order to preserve my Arabic. That it gives me a chance to practice so I don't forget more and more because I've forgotten a lot. I'm not using it. My job is, is generally far away from, uh, although I speak Arabic with some of my students because they're lower level, but I, I'm away from it. I'm, I don't have the chance to sit with the scholars anymore because of my own personal situation so I'm not engaged in those environments so for me I use the Arabic I try to read sometimes hadith in the nusus in Arabic and sometimes the statements of the scholars in Arabic and this is for my own preservation of the language and to keep the fluidity of the Arabic language uh, however depending on the particular situation and the particular community you will probably lose use less or more Arabic and that depends upon the audience that you're reaching. Some of the people that listen uh, to our lectures are people who are kind of students of the Arabic language. So for them, they benefit from hearing those, uh, hearing additional words, hearing, they learn words, even if they're not students of Arabic. If you hear me say certain words and certain principles over and over and over, you begin to even memorize some of those principles. It will become uh, something which is beneficial for you. So we should never uh, be repulsed by the Arabic language because the Arabic language is the key. It's just the key to open the door to the Quran and the Sunnah. You cannot be truly uh, a ever a reach the level of scholarship, true scholarship in Islam without the Arabic language. Without the Arabic language, you cannot truly reach, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, truly reach because never will all of these sources, the important sources even, be, for example, even the key to Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim. 
tiny bits of statements have been translated into the English language. And English is probably one of the most uh, emphasized and translated, uh, has the most translated works, more than French, more than uh, uh, the language, whatever they speak in Luxembourg, or other, you know, they speak French and other languages there, I'm sure. The point being, English is widespread, but there's still such a lack of true material and to get the true understanding and insight. To reach true scholarship, no way without the Arabic language. So we should never uh, look down on that. Another point that he mentioned, may Allah forgive us in him and bless us in him, he says, we tend to romanticize out of culture. Uh, I would also say that a lot of us who have lived overseas and had a chance to study, that there's probably a lot of truth in that. In that we, and the longer we stay, the more we see the good and the bad of being in these societies, the negatives and the positive, because there's no doubt there's negatives and there are positives. And we begin, as we mature, hopefully, as individuals, that we begin to mature and kind of establish our own identity. And I'll give you one example. Uh, I have different books here. I have English books, especially for my research, and I have books about my own history and culture. African American culture and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't take away from your Salafiyah. It doesn't take away from your Islam. That you read and expand your horizon and knowledge. If you're Pakistani and you want to know about the history of Pakistan, that doesn't take away and doesn't mean you're nationalist. That means that you want more insight of what is around you in the reality. Or if you're a political scientist, you need to study what about the political systems around you. The point being, Habitifillah is that as we mature, hopefully, that we can recognize those differences and recognize uh, also not romanticize anything, uh, anything beyond its, uh, beyond the, uh, beyond its reality. So uh, a lot of us, yes, we take the dress, a certain dress we wear, you know, especially when I was first coming from Yemen and other places like this, in my personal experience, and I know a lot of people also with this, in our youth, we you would never have caught me without a thobe. You would never have caught me, even back then, because I was coming from Yemen, I used to wear izar all the time. Izar, shalwar kamis, or whatever above it. So I used to look like I came from that thing and would implant that in Seattle. Uh, as I've matured and grown, and establish my own identity and come back and made the gem as uh, as far as your identity because we're complex individuals as human beings we are complex we have different identities we have different cultures okay a Pakistani American has a different experience than an African American generally a Caucasian a white American has a different experience perhaps than an African American or an Indian American, or a Bangladeshi American, whatever the case may be, or a British Pakistani brother, or a Afro-Caribbean brother, uh, Afro-Caribbean British brother, whatever you want to say, that our experiences are unique, and that doesn't take away from us. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as nations and tribes so that we would get to know one another, not be arrogant towards one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks to the heart. Ataqwa huna kama qala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So anyhow, getting back to the point, is that we should not glorify uh, anything beyond its bounds and we establish our own identities and that is for the individual. And I'll give you an example that I've related once before as an aside is, uh, as I was mentioning in my books, uh, a, a good friend of mine, may Allah bless him and preserve him and forgive us in him, he came into my maktaba once in, uh, when I was living in Jeddah and he said, he saw my book and it was something, some African-American uh, historical book or something like this. And he said, Achi, you're still reading that black stuff or something like this. He's African-American, by the way. And I said, yep, I'm still black. <laughs> it didn't change. You know, this is my heritage. This is where I come from. It doesn't take away from me. It doesn't make me above someone. But this is who I am. It's, it's my culture. So I am, I come from that cultural background and... 
and even that is di diverse. It's not the same. Depends on your social status. Depends on your education. Because you're African American doesn't mean you came in the street. Because you're African American doesn't mean you graduated from the university. Because you're African American doesn't mean this, it doesn't mean that. But you have your own unique experience is the point I'm trying to make. The third point the brother mentioned, Salafis only criticize and hate to see autonomy and thinking. Two points with this, Salafis only criticize. Not just uh, Salafis and Ahl Sunnah, but we also have to realize that these are points of, this is how the religion was preserved. It doesn't mean being excessive. It doesn't mean going beyond the bounds. But there's no doubt you have to distinguish the truth between falsehood. The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, Whoever sees good, uh, whoever sees a munkar, then they should change it with his hand. And if they're unable to do so, change it with his his tongue. And if he, I mean, he's speaking out against it. If he's unable to do so, change it with his heart. And that is the weakest form of iman. So that's from iman to distinguish and sometimes criticize. Not to belittle, not to attack the people's honor, but you have to distinguish between truth and falsehood. That is just what Islam requires for us. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you command the people with good and forget yourselves? So we should not forget ourselves in that. But, Do you command the people with good? Letting us know that you should be commanding the people with good, but you should not forget yourself. That's the mafhum mukhalifa in that. That's the, the implied meaning of that. And there's so many ayats uh, that mention commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Imam Anawi also mentions about this in the Riyadh Salihin you can find, which is translated in English. He will have the chapter entitled uh, that the chapter of Ghiba Muharram, I think it is, that the prohibited Ghiba. And then also showing also that Ghiba is sometimes Ghiba, in general, the, the terminology, we use it as a negative, that it is impermissible, but showing that sometimes it's permissible to speak about some uh, people to warn the community. If you're going to marry your daughter to someone, you don't. You need to know if, it, oh, this brother is a br brother of bad character, this brother is a person of bid'ah, he goes to the graves and, and worships the grave, or whatever the case may be. You need to know that knowledge. That requires and that is made clear through criticism. So this is a part of Islam. It has been through the history. Even the people who totally reject criticism, the imams that if they take from Bukhari, if they take from Muslim, if they take from Imam Tirmidhi, if they take from Sunan Abi Dawood, if they take uh, Imam Abu Dawood, whoever from the great imams of the Sunnah, those books are preserved through criticism, through the science of criticism. So it's absolutely... Uh, something you need to check on yourself. Likewise, even in contemporary times, you'll find if you go, if I go right now and I sit with Jamaat al Tabliq, even if I in my local locality when I'm in Seattle, which is closest to my the house that I stay in sometimes, my mother's house, when I'm visiting, I pray in a, a masjid which is a, a stronghold of Tabliq, and even they are a lot of them are Ashidi. There's a mix in there, but they have all kind of eclectic aqidah. But I have good men, I have good uh, relations with them. I don't. I can't go in there and make Hajar being the one or two or three few Salafis that are collected in there, and 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 make they they know my stance. They don't. They know that when they start to give their bayan and say, I, I leave the masjid, they already know. I can talk to the imam in a civil manner, okay? And he once even said, he said I asked him about a school. I saw, oh, this is a a school program. He said, you really wouldn't be interested. And he was basically making, saying that, hey, it's from our, you know, it's an Ashari school. You're probably not going to want your school, your sons to go there. So the point being is I can have civ civility and likewise, they will not ask me to do a lecture or a khutbah there. Never. But all, many of the other masajid in that, in Seattle area, Tacoma, the other surrounding civ cities, I'm invited. And they know I'm Salafi. So my point is this, is that you will find from all the groups they criticize. They may not openly, but if you try to correct them, if you try to sit with them, if you try to invite them, you'll see. And you'll see that they, the strength of their sometimes, that they don't want autonomous thinking. They want you to think like Ashari. They want you to think Sufi. They want you to think uh, you know, in a, and agree with a Khwana Muslimin, or they want you to be Takfiri. They all distinguish, all the groups distinguish, Wallahumma Sta'an.
Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, If tarqatil yahuda la eta wa sab'in firqa, wa tarqatil nasara la thunatayn wa sab'in firqa, wa said, Taftariku hadi umma la thalata wa sab'in firqa. Sorry to give it in Arabic, but I prefer to give these texts in their, give them their haq. Anyway, the Prophet ﷺ said, the, the Jews in the 71 sects, Christians 72 sects, my Ummah 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one. He said, who are they, Ya Rasulullah? He said, they, those who are upon what I'm upon and what my companions are upon. Letting us know the, the divisions are always going to be there. They are there. They're inherent. But you just want to make sure that you are on the straight path. You are doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. You're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with knowledge and fiqh and understanding and insight. And you're giving everyone their rights. And they're not, you're not being extreme in how you deal with the people. You deal with the people in an Islamic way. And knowing and understanding that some of those, sometimes it's necessary to, uh, of course it's necessary to distinguish the truth from falsehood, and sometimes it's necessary to do the other ahkam. Sometimes it's necessary, and this comes from fiqh, this comes from knowledge, and understanding and wisdom on how to implement these principles, that sometimes it requires making hajjah, you know, meaning to uh, be away from, uh, particular individuals because of their creed. Are you going to now, with the, in the climate now, sit with people who are supporters of ISIS? Sit with people who are supporters of, uh, of uh, spilling blood and destroying the people? No. You're going to speak about them and criticize them. You're going to stay away from them, so you're making hajjah of them. Perhaps you might not even make salams to them. You might not even give them salams because you disagree staunchly with the evil that they're upon. And you don't want to be associated because in the dunya you can feel repercussions and the akhirah. In the dunya you might go to jail for being associated with them. In the akhirah you're going to, you will be held accountable with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for who you uh, make as your companions. Uh, another point the brother made, and may Allah bless us in him, he said we need to stop looking to so-called scholars of the Arab world. And I believe I'm going to give the brother the benefit of the doubt because he did explain himself further in the statement he said, yes, we do need scholars from there still, but anyhow, so on and so forth, that we should be careful of belittling the scholars of Ahl Sunnah. And uh, because of their level, their experience, their level in knowledge, their elm, their fit, their basira, their whiteness in their beard from putting in countless hours and their sacrifice for the religion and upholding the religion and explaining the religion and preserving the religion, this is why we look up to them. We look up to them and we benefit from them. That doesn't negate the fact that in the future we will need scholars in all of these lands, you know. If as long as there is a Muslim population there, you will need scholarship. That does not negate the scholarship that we have, meaning that we have students of knowledge, some, and they have different levels, some are beginners, some are in the middle, some are have another level, some are very strong. And we have some individuals that perhaps in our society would be considered scholars for that society. And that's very important to distinguish these things. And I don't want to get deep into those issues because people have so much wasted kalam about these things. But I've said what I've said, and I think it's clear, and I hope it's, it's clear, inshallah ta'ala. So we do need scholarship, and in the future, we hope to. But I can honestly say I don't know of too many people, or in fact any who would, who probably have that level or would accept that level to give fatwa from people that I trust from Ahl Sunnah. Now there's Ahl Bid'ah out there, there are Khwana Muslimin guys out there, some of them who have strong knowledge. Some of them have strong knowledge in, in certain uh, fields of knowledge and branches, perhaps even some Sufis and other things that have, have done studies, but they have deviancy. You wouldn't go to them for for anything, for them, for that matter, for the most part. Because we have uh, Ahl Sunnah that is mojud, that is present, that has. Now I know certain brothers that have reached, and I'll just throw out some names, that I believe that have a strong knowledge, a uh, strong sense of, of knowledge and fiqh, and that they are uh, like Sheikh, that I will say Sheikh, and he's referred to as Sheikh, I think, by other Mashaikh in, in Yemen and so forth. And this is Sheikh uh, Abdurrahman Omeysan, that he's known. He is El Wafak. So I don't think he would put himself out there and say he can make fatwa, but he knows he is, uh, in, in our mujtama, in our society, no doubt he would be someone, you know, has the strength to where you can refer your fears. Likewise, our brother Tahir Wyatt. Also, he's reached the level of scholarship, and this is from the Fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and that you can uh, ask them uh, questions and benefit from their knowledge. And they have a, a they can lead communities and, and go forward and go for, uh, forth. However, I wouldn't say that they're on the level of giving fatawa, nor would I uh, do I believe that they hold this? Uh, would they? They would probably be repulsed if you ask them to give these uh, to go into that field and that they are on that level. So this is the importance: is knowing the level that everyone has different levels. But we do need scholars because when we just cut and paste and get fatawa from around the world, you go into a village in Yemen, for example, to imagine and you ask for a fatwa to apply in Toronto or to apply in Seattle. Uh, Part of that fatwa, or the fatwa, is a very important principle, and they, the scholars, they say, that a part of making a ruling on something is that you have a correct understanding of that. So their understanding, our scholars that do not live in America and do have not lived the life in America, their tesoar only comes from what students have given them, students from those countries. So if they have a good tesoar, then it gives more validity to their fatwa. So that's what I will say It's very important for us to understand that of course they don't know what it's like to have been a drug dealer and a gangster and then to come to Islam and the trials and tribulations that uh, a brother who was from Jamaica experience, a brother from the deep hood in Philly or, or, or Cali somewhere or whatever, or the sister who reverted who's a white convert and she's had uh, a certain kind of family environment and background and she comes to Islam. They only know this is by what the people give to them as a surrounding. So this helps for the accuracy of their fatwa or this can affect the inaccuracy of their fatwa. So it's very important for us to understand this, that yes, and that when we get fatwa from the scholars, that we need to give them a, a, a strong tesoa, a strong background of what it, uh, of, of our issues and problems. Uh, and that also relates to don't understand our problems. And I think enough has been said, and I hope that this is a, a light and a guidance for us all, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with ikhlas, with bat. and I wanted it to be just a couple of minutes, and as usual, I always speak way beyond uh, what I intend, but I have so much to say sometimes about some of these topics, and hopefully that it's beneficial, and hopefully it's a source of guidance on our scales, and not a source of uh, sin, or deviance, or misguidance.